G'day, my name is James Tanton. I'm a mathematician and mathematics educator, and for the past 25 years of my career, I've pursued my strong passion for promoting effective and meaningful mathematics education. I was a college professor for 10 years, a high school teacher for 10 years, and now I consult with teachers and students across the nation and overseas on matters of teaching, teaching mathematics with context, purpose, and relevance, and with joy, joy for the student and the teacher alike. Mathematics thinking and doing should be naturally joyful because mathematics should always be seen as meaningful and relevant and real. It seems evident to me that proponents for the Common Core feel the same. I want to take the time now to explain why I believe this is so. I want to share my take on what I think the Common Core in mathematics is and what it ultimately wants to do. So, for starters, Let's be clear on what the Common Core state standards actually are. Like really, what are we actually talking about here? The Common Core state standards for mathematics are nothing but a list. A list of mathematics topics. Actually, they are two lists. One is a very, very long list of very specific pieces of actual mathematics. Know how to add two fractions. Know how to do long multiplication. Know what standard deviation is, how to compute it, and what it means, and so on with guidelines as to when throughout the years, from kindergarten to grade 12, these specific topics ought to be taught. You can see all the topics, if you like, by downloading the Common Core document for yourself or by looking at illustratedmath.org. There is nothing overtly surprising about this list. It really is the same mathematical content in terms of math facts that we've been covering for decades. It is just that this time, mathematicians and mathematics educators got together and really sat down and thought about the flow of topics. What actually makes sense to students, given their intellectual development as they grow from being age 5 to age 18? And what makes sense in how the story of mathematics unfolds and builds on itself? And what is best so that students really understand topics for themselves? Let's not be a mile wide and only an inch deep. It was this behind the scenes work that is a significant accomplishment. The other list, actually the first list in the Common Core State Standards document, is actually very short. It is a list of just eight mathematical practice standards. That is just eight well-articulated ideas that explains what it means to be a really effective thinker and doer of mathematics, and of science too. These eight practice standards are an explicit call to really make sure we teach thinking. To me, these practice standards are the backbone of the Common Core State Standards. And I would personally go further and say that the very first mathematical practice standard is the one that really typifies the ultimate goal of the Common Core. Mathematical practice standard number one is not only a mathematics skill, it is an essential life skill. It is what I aim to teach for all my years in the classroom, and is the idea that I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk. So, here it is. Mathematical practice standard number one. Make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Here's why I think it is crucial we have an educational system that actively attends to this. Imagine if our children came out of their 12 years of schooling joyfully saying and genuinely feeling and believing for themselves, we solve problems, we don't give up easily. Can you imagine how confident we would feel for the future of our globe? There's certainly going to be problems our next generation will face and there'll be no answers in the back of the textbook for them. There never are in real life problems. In all my years of teaching, I've strived to help students of all ages, youngsters, high schoolers, and college students, to be confident thinkers, to pause and use their common sense and their wits to work on challenges, to have the confidence to nut their way through things, to persevere and work to find success. And I sincerely hope I really did this to some meaningful degree. I always thought that even before the Common Core, that the curriculum content says to do this. So be honest. Think about your own high school math experience. Did the content itself prepare you for life and work? When was the last time you used the quadratic formula, say, from high school algebra in your everyday work or even everyday life? The content is actually a vehicle for teaching thinking, for teaching problem solving, for teaching mature mathematical problem solving. The system of mathematics education we have today, by and large, does not operate this way. Memorize fact and busyness of understanding and depth. Yes, I taught Algebra 2 to students, but I did so in the light of helping my students develop into sophisticated thinking adults with, hopefully, the ability and the confidence to adapt their mathematical literacy to other contexts if needed.
The thinking was every bit as important, if not more so, as the content. We talked about quadratics for sure, but they served as a focus point for learning, for how to use our common sense to nut things out as needed. Now, I was required to teach the quadratic formula by the system I was in, but it itself was not the goal of my classroom discussions. My students never needed to memorize the formula, yet alone learn a song to help them memorize it. They could figure it out for themselves when, if, they ever actually needed it. Now, don't get me wrong. It is important that students develop the basic and necessary mathematical skills for life and of further mathematical work. It really would be annoying for a student, and us adults, if he or she was always tripping up over four times six, say, or had trouble working out that chucking a 540 on a snowboard corresponds to one and a half turns. So students do need to practice and do need to do exercises to develop fluency. What I worry about is that in the traditional and unenlightened curriculum, exercises, exercises galore, busy, busy worksheets galore, have become the defining experience for students and parents of what mathematics in the classroom is and should be. We develop the impression that speed means understanding, that speed without thinking even beats understanding. We regularly test students on how well they get speed answers to specific what questions. Worksheets galore are great training for this. Dr. Joe Bowler, Professor of Mathematics Education at Stanford University, calls this cultural perception of mathematics in the classroom, math as performance. She's just released a terrific video about this, where she also gives her vision of why the US needs the common core. Of course, the natural and appropriate tactic surviving in a culture of math as performance is memorization. Just memorize procedures and do them. Devote little time to understanding and next to no time to playing with ideas, extending them further, pushing them in new directions, that is spend next to no time engaging in the practices of problem solving. But with only memorization and nothing else to hold on to, what happens if you forget the memorized procedure? All you can say is, I don't remember how to do that type of problem, and you have no choice but then to put down your pencil and give up. Worse, what do you do if you see a problem slightly different from the one you've memorized how to do? When are two problems in life exactly the same? I and the Common Core want to turn that around. Worksheets for fluency? Sure. Problem solving for learning? Yes, absolutely. It is vital. So let's be clear with what a problem is. I agree with Dr. Alan Schoenfeld's definition. Dr. Schoenfeld is a professor of mathematics and education at Berkeley. He says, a problem is only a problem, as mathematicians use the word, if you don't know how to go about solving it. A problem that has no surprises in store and can be solved comfortably by routine or familiar procedures, no matter how difficult, is an exercise. So anything that feels routine is not a problem. That would be an exercise. And we've certainly developed an educational experience in the US where students are good at solving exercises. But is that what the US really wants? A generation of citizens that is good at answering questions that have all been solved before? are routine and whose answers can be looked up at the back of a book or on the internet? Does Apple, Google and Wall Street want to hire folk with that as their primary skill? Real problems are hard. They make you uncomfortable. You usually don't know how to tackle them. Sometimes you don't even know how to make a first start on them. I'm a mathematician and I have a penchant for interesting problems about mathematics itself. But problems appear at all levels of work and science. My wife, Dr. Linda Elkins Tanton, is a geophysicist. She studies and models mechanisms for planet formation and works on the question of what makes a planet habitable. She's also a lead scientist on proposal for a new space mission, one to send a probe to the asteroid Psyche. Why visit this asteroid? Because Psyche is the only known object in the solar system that is a failed planet. All the outer mantle of this fledging planet was stripped away at some point, leaving behind just the metal core. Going to Psyche is our only chance of ever seeing the inside of a planet. I love this, we have to go to outer space to see inner space. The knowledge we learn from this mission, A, will be fascinating in its own right, and B, will hopefully shed new knowledge about the structure and mechanics of magma flow on this planet. We humans care about the structure and workings of the Earth. We care about volcanoes and earthquakes and our magnetic field. My wife and her team of scientists have been working on this proposal for years now. Talk about perseverance. And this is only for writing a proposal to submit to NASA. Only if the proposal is accepted and funded will the real work begin. 
It has been fascinating for me to observe my wife and her team work through the challenges of designing and sending a probe to an asteroid. Sure, some aspects of this challenge are now routine exercises of sorts for space scientists. Planning a trajectory and a high orbit for a probe can be done with good numerical modeling on computers, for example. But other aspects have been a big problem from the get-go. How do you balance the mass of the instruments with the amount of fuel you can bring on board? How can you deduce a particular scientific measurement if you can't carry the instrument that would measure that feature directly? How can we figure out the density distribution of the object as we approach it? And problems keep coming up. Here's the latest one. In order to go into a low orbit around the asteroid, the team discovered that the probe will have to spend some significant amount of time each period on the far side of the asteroid, out of contact with the sun. It occurred to the engineers that during that time, the solar pan panels on the probe might cool down below 180 degrees Kelvin and crack. The challenge was, is it possible to create a low orbit without the probe ever being eclipsed from the sun? The answer turned out to be no. Gulp. All right, what is the minimal amount of time the solar panels could be in the dark before they cool down below 180 degrees? Experiments in liquid nitrogen, which is not actually quite cold enough, revealed that the probe could survive a maximum of 45 minutes in the dark. So the next question is, is it possible to put the probe in a low orbit with no more than 45 minutes at a time in eclipse? After lots of hard, scary calculations and lots of worry, they eventually found an orbit that will work. And this question is actually both practical and abstract. Scientists don't actually know the exact size and shape of the asteroid. So the question was really one of the type. With a range of possible parameters, will there always exist an orbit one can use once we get there? Now that's a harder challenge. Teachers will often hear the cry in the classroom, why do we need to know this? This is a valid question. But I actually think the premise of this question is sadly misplaced. The question comes as a consequence of the math as performance culture. If we are being asked to give answer after answer to questions that we weren't even asking in the first place, there must be some hidden point to it all. What? The response from curriculum writers in the past was help students see the real world use of what they are learning. So they created real world problems to insert into traditional courses. But they were often false real world problems. Here's the sort of thing I've seen in high school textbooks over and over again. A company makes and sells widgets. Analysts have identified that the profit in producing and selling X widgets per week is given by the following quadratic formula. P of X equals 3000 plus 200 X minus X squared. How many widgets should the company produce and sell each week in order to maximize the profit? This sort of thing is hokey beyond belief, and students see right through it. Students are smart. No company thinks this way, and certainly no company would know an exact formula of any kind for their profits. This real-world problem is just another exercise in disguise, a routine task to answer yet another thinly-veiled what question that is really only testing whether or not a formula has been memorized. Our society thinks that the purpose of mathematics is utilitarian, to get concrete numerical answers to concrete practical problems. So, what must a mathematician do all day? She probably just sits in her office doing longer and longer calculations from week to week, month to month. Think about it. Really? It is true that mathematics has great practical use. There is serious number calculation going on mapping of trajectory to psyche. But there's so much more to mathematics and mathematics doing. Mathematics is really about the thinking behind those calculations. Think about Psyche. What are you going to do when you find out that the shape of Psyche is not what you expected? How can you write a program that will adapt and modify the calculations if parameters for the situation keep changing? How do you create a program that checks itself as it goes along? Mistakes are costly. Is it theoretically possible to even write a program that will always converge to an answer and not go into some infinite cycle of approximations? In fact, how do rounding errors affect final answers? Does it matter if we round answers up or down to the next decimal place? Or do all approximations converge to the same answer in the end? Do we even know if the set of equations we're working with have a solution in the first place? Or are we doomed before we even start looking for solutions? These questions progress from the practical to thinking theoretical questions. Mathematicians spend week after week, month after month, thinking. They think about problems on the very concrete level, all the way up to problems on the abstract and theoretical level. They're constantly working to solve problems. Teaching Algebra 2 or any, or any topic in the curriculum should absolutely be about teaching, thinking for mathematical problem solving. Why do we need to know this? The answer is, 
You may never need to know this if you're thinking only in terms of the formulas and the details on the page. But if it is clear we're teaching for the thinking and the problem solving and the mathematical confidence, then the answer becomes self-evident. We are learning this for intellectual empowerment and confidence. We need to do this because we're doing everything we can to learn how to solve problems. There is another aspect to this issue. Imagine, for example, students in an English class asking, why do we need to know this? In fact, do they ask that? A knee-jerk reaction from society could be, like it has been to mathematics to some degree, oops, okay then, no more poetry, we don't need to know that. No more Shakespeare, no more fiction writing. This feels so wrong. We humans are drawn to beauty and elegance. It speaks to our souls. It uplifts and it is vital to our well-being and joy in life. Poetry, form, art, expression, creativity is our humanness. Why play the violin? Because it is beautiful. It is joyful and that is important. And why do mathematics? Because it really is beautiful too and should always be joyful. Mankind has been engaged in mathematical thinking for many thousands of years. The book with the most number of editions ever printed is the Bible. The runner-up of the most reprinted text is, believe it or not, a math book. Euclid's famous geometry text, The Elements. There is something to this math gig in and of itself. We can't discount this. One often hears people say, math is beautiful but they don't usually ever give an example to back up this claim. Let me give you one of my favorite examples of this. It was this sort of play that made me a mathematician. Here's a picture. It looks like a picture of 25 dots arranged in a five by five array. But let me tell you, this is actually a picture of the sum one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus four plus three plus two plus one. Do you see that sum in the picture? You might stare at it for a while, wondering why I think it's a picture of this sum. But eventually, you will have an epiphany. Pause now if you don't want me to ruin that experience for you. Focus on the diagonals of the array, and then, like magic, you see the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. The diagonals cover all the dots in the picture, so the sum must equal 25, all the dots in the picture. So without a lick of arithmetic, we can see, really see, that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 equals 25. And in fact, without a lick of arithmetic, we can also see in our mind's eye that the sum from 1, 2, 3, up to 10, and back down again, comes from the diagonals of a 10 by 10 square. So the sum equals the count of all dots in a 10 by 10 array, 100. And we can add up all the numbers from 1 up to 100 and back down again in a split of a second. The answer must be 100 times 100, which is 10,000. Try doing that on a calculator. How long will it take you to type in 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way up to 99 plus 100 then back down again? The power of a simple visual idea beats the machine. I love the simplicity of this picture, this very picture here, and the surprise of the richness of what can be discovered by mulling on it. This is beauty in mathematics. Now I suppose I could tell you the general formula for these sums, and you could dutifully memorize it and then prove to me that you've memorized it by answering questions under speed on a test. But what would be the joy in that? And what would be the real learning? Will you still have that formula in your head a week after the test? Look, without a memorized formula, you, you personally know these sums. From now on, every time you see an array of dots, you'll think to look at the diagonals. And this type of joyful, joyful doing can take you further if you want. I worked with a group of high school students one semester, and these students looked at pictures of grids of dots just like these, mulling on different ways to view them. They discovered a whole host of surprising formulas and relationships between numbers. Some of these relationships were new to the world, and they even published a paper explaining their results. They are co-authors on a mathematics paper, just from joyful playing with ideas. And if you're worried that this is too much like poetry, and not enough of the nuts and bolts and the grammar of mathematics, know that formulas like these actually play a very important role in very practical problems. We live in a world of science. We live in a world of data. We collect data, we analyze and organize data, we draw graphs of data. One often needs to know the area under a graph. It usually represents the total accumulation of some quantity. For example, if this is the graph of the speed of the probe, then the area under the graph equals the total distance it has traveled. Important to know. But it's hard to work with the areas of curved shapes. 
How are we going to figure out the area of a curved shape? That's a problem. Well, we can at least approximate the area by drawing rectangles and adding up the areas of the rectangles. And adding up areas of rectangles like these looks just like one of the sums 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. A big part of the topic of calculus is about finding better and better approximations to areas under curves and it relies on knowing how to handle all sorts of different sums. This is why summation formulas of different kinds are part of the curriculum. And now you, reason really you, have the basic foundational thinking for integral calculus under your belt, just like that. The paradoxical, th paradoxical thing about mathematics is that invariably, even if you think a particular topic or idea is strange or abstruse or fanciful and disconnected from reality, how much like poetry it seems, the practical applications, the real concrete uses, are never usually far behind in surprising and unexpected ways. We cannot predict where ideas will go. Mathematics is stunning that way. Solving problems, real problems, is hard. Real problems are meaningful. They have a context, a goal, a purpose. Now the goal could be a very practical one, to get a probe to Psyche, to get a bridge to stand, to compute the area under a data curve. Or it could be a goal for beauty. Either way, there is a meaningful purpose to a real problem. The Common Core for Mathematics wants to really teach students to develop the confidence to solve problems. Real ones, not contrived ones, real problems. It wants to teach students all the usual mathematical content and teach students how to tackle real practical problems and real mathematical problems. The Common Core wants to teach students to be self-reliant thinkers. In fact, every state across the US wants this, even the states that have rejected the Common Core. Each of those states has developed or is in the process of developing a curriculum with these same goals. We're actually on the same page. We all want to do it and we all want to do it right. And I have my fingers crossed, I want it to be done well. Now let me go back to what I asked at the beginning of this talk. Imagine if our children came out of their 12 years of schooling joyfully saying and genuinely feeling and believing for themselves, we solve problems, we don't give up easily. Can you imagine how confident we would feel for the future of our globe? Thank you.